Excellent. So this is the third fuzzing course that I'm going to go through. Um, it should be fuzzing zero two because I count from zero, obviously. That's how normal people count. And we're going to go into sort of fuzzing strategies and what I would call sanitizers. And based on this, we're going to look a bit at memory, particularly what virtual memory is and what paging is. So first things first, just going to go through a review of the basic fundamentals of you know things like AFL. So the idea with fuzzing is we have some source code, C, Golang, doesn't really matter what it is. And we have, in the normal scenario, we have a compiler. So this can be Clang, for instance. And we pump the source code through the compiler and out pops a binary. You have a binary on the side. One of the most common things to do with creating uh, source code or creating binaries in software is to develop in a test driven development sense. So what you would do here is you would have a set of requirements. Let's just say requirement one, two and three. And what you would do is you de decide sort of before you've developed the software, what does a successful outcome look like? Well, you know, I'm developing a web application. What should this web application be able to do? What should its functionality be? And what you have there is you have a bunch of data to support this and a bunch of tests. You don't really write, I mean, you don't have to write these first. I'm not trying to imply that. But you have this idea that you've got some data and you've got some tests. And the, the, these data and tests will check whether or not the requirements have been hit within this sort of test-driven development. So what you might have is you go through, you write the source code as a, fun, as an, as a software engineer, you compile it into a binary, and you start running these tests to see if you've hit the functionality of 1, 2, and 3. If you have, then you can say the requirements have been hit, and you know the software is supposed to do what it's supposed to do. Now, a really basic example is if you have an email input field, and what you want to do is make sure that it accepts valid email addresses and rejects invalid email addresses. As we detailed last week, you would go through, give a bunch of valid email addresses, give a bunch of invalid email addresses, and as part of the requirements is what it should accept and shouldn't accept, you can write that in a unit test. So that's very sort of more typical uh, testing. What I like to say with fuzzing, as always, is that it's more to do with auditing. So the first thing I ever spoke about, and I'll, I'll detail this week because it's, it seems to be the easier example. So we have this program called AFL, and we can either compile the source code normal, normally into a binary, do these unit tests, but we can also push it through an AFL compiler, and out pops a binary for fuzzing. And this is what I would call auditing. So this is the audit side, whereas this is sort of the function side. This idea of test-driven development is supposed to prove and verify functionality. Does the software I've developed hit those basic set of requirements as laid out in the test plan? But at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have bugs in the software. That's a separate issue. Fuzzing in this sort of auditing piece here is... We've made sure that the functionality is all good and it's fine. And fuzzing, we're going to do basic bug checking and sanity checking. Are there any scenarios or weird edge cases that can cause a problem or some sort of issue for the actual underlying source code? Not just for exploitation reasons or vulnerability development reasons, but also is there any little weird sort of idiosyncrasies that might cause issues or performance problems for the actual software itself. So, so fuzzing is always like this auditing in two halves. You always say, number one, we want to see if we've got bugs, but number two, does it just do what we want in some way? So it may not be exploitable, but we still have this notion that we're going to fuzz stuff for the purpose of auditing. And this is the sort of whole concept that we're going to that, that, that we've been working from. The other thing that I'll say too is the sort of fuzzing cycle. So the fuzzing cycle or it's the process, is, as I said previously, you have some sort of source code here. And we need to compile it, at least in the sense with instrumentation, we need to compile it into a binary. So step one, compile the actual source code. 
in the previous example, we used the AFL, let's say just AFL GCC, even though it's obsolete to make it simple. So we use AFL GCC, <clears throat> push the source code into AFL GCC, and out pops our binary. As part of this process, we need to also be able to inject data into this binary somehow. So that's either via STD in or a file. So we can pass file, we can pass some data into the underlying functionality we want to test, much in the same way you would do with the unit tests, or you can use the LLVM fuzzer test one input paradigm that I explained last week. And if we have all of this, we have this binary has been instrumented, but not only that, we've got a way to pass data, either via standard input or a file, or a file descriptor of some sort. Then we have what we can do, you know, we can actually fuzz the data. Well, sorry, fuzz the program. So we have, you know, this is step one, do the compiling, find a way to inject data or pass data to the binary. And step two, we take the binary, we load it up into the engine, AFL, does all the nice management stuff for us. We have some sort of input directory that has test cases. So it's test cases. AFL loads this binary. Let's say this is this is where it loads it, down on the bottom right. So this binary's been loaded. It reads this input, mutates it in some way. Bit flipping, byte flipping, that havoc fuzz tester I was, or the havoc mutation strategy I was saying. Sends this to the binary, checks, does this hang? Does it like which is another name for an infinite loop? Does it crash or does it exit cleanly? But each time that it does one of those things, we also out pops this little bit of instrumentation through this little bit of instrumentation. We get these tracing files and these these tracing uh, this tracing data out, and um, we're able to generate or more constructively and more intelligently, we're able to find new paths through the program using this sort of strategy. So I just sort of wanted to just cover that off. So that's the whole the whole idea of fuzzing, right? It is this this new way, I wouldn't say new way, this is this really good way of being able to audit source code, whether or not it's from a binary, written in C, C++, even Golang, whether or not it's written in Python, if uh, some of you played with things like JavaScript as well, to try and get fuzzers working. We want to find, is there some sort of way that the source code in, you know, in any particular way can fall over or behave differently than what we expect to try and find bugs before they go out the door. Step one, need to find a way to pass data and compile it. Step two, we run it under some engine. The engine in this example is AFL, which will work with C and C++ code or compiled code. But that's the idea. I just wanted to sort of cover that off as a bit of a <clears throat> bit of a revision session. No, I've just realised. Oh no, I don't. So, as part of this strategy, what we want to sort of detail now is this idea of, I guess, big bugs versus small bugs. And I'm going to use a parser for it as an example. So let's say we have some sort of parser, an XML parser, JSON parser. It doesn't really matter. It's just something that takes data, either tries to process it through a type length value, a TLV, or it tries to read data and pop it into and, and, and do sort of checks much like ASN1 works to be able to infer what this data means. We want to take a data blob from an external environment when we want to be able to read it. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to introduce some bugs. Wherever you see a big circle, this is a big critical bug that's going to cause some sort of functional issue or crash within the binary. But just because there's a big bug doesn't mean there's also small bugs. So these little squares are, I would say, the smaller bugs. So what we're going to do <clears throat> is in the first instance, if this is some sort of parser, in the first instance, it makes sense to let's find and identify these bigger bugs first before these smaller bugs. Now, the way we're going to do that is with something called a sanitizer. And the ones I like to use, or the one that you're most going to come across, is a dress sanitizer. And you can introduce it on the command line for the compiler. But I'm going to demonstrate very quickly what it actually does. So if I remember what to do, what I'm going to do is write some code quickly. Uh, just, just change to slash temp. And we're going to write a test C file very quickly. Dot h int main dot c char 
I'm going to ask some questions about people to people and make sure they understand how this stuff works. So we're going to make a char buffer. Let's call it buffer zero, and we're going to give it a a a. -A. Oh, actually, no, that's probably not a good idea. Let's get let's make it nine 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 characters big, and we're going to fill it with let's just say zero x one. Uh, 4 1 for A's. And we're going to have another buffer called buffer 1. We're going to fill it with B's. Then, if I just need to include this bit of data, I'll throw this header file, include string.h, mem copy, buff 0, buff 1, 10. Just compile this test.c dash out test. Cool. So, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze this bit of code here. So, what this is doing is we're creating two buffers of 10 big. So, just two strings that can have 10 characters in them. And the first string we're filling with 0x for 1, which, if you know your hexadecimal and ASCII tables, that's A, capital A, and 0x for 2 is capital B. All we're going to do is we're going to use memcopy, which takes a block of memory and copies it to another block of memory. So what's happening here is the destination buffer is buff0, so this first one, and the source buffer is buff1. We're copying 10 bytes from this buffer, remember this buffer here, to this buffer, this buffer here, and just returning. So that's what we're doing. And I very quickly built this and ran it and nothing happened. What's going to happen now is this is a very classic example of a buffer overflow. What I'm going to do now is I've changed this destination buffer here to be 9 bytes big, still filled with A's, but buffer 1 is 10 bytes big, filled with B's, and we're going to copy 10 bytes. So we've got this issue now. So we have these two buffers. We have the first buffer, buffer is it buff 0. And this is 9 bytes large. We have a second buffer, buff 1. And this is 10 bytes large. And we're copying this buffer and we're overlaying it to this buffer. So we're copying this like this. We're copying it from buffer 1 to buffer 0. However, the problem is now, buffer 1 is one byte larger than buffer 0. So what happens here is anything that sits on in memory here, this is, this is an example of a stack, is going to overflow this buffer by one byte. If you do this enough times, you'll hit other interesting things on the stack, particularly the return address, or if you're on Windows, the... Um, structured exception handler chains and sort of other such interesting particular in, interesting things or stack cookies I won't go into them now but this is the idea we're going to copy this buffer that's too big we're going to copy it to this first buffer buffer zero and we're going to overwrite it by one byte and if anything important lives here in memory right here and it causes some sort of issue i.e. the return address and we clobber it we're going to get some sort of bug occurring now in either case even though it's only overwriting by one even if this doesn't do anything wrong, this is still a bug because we can never be sure in every circumstance that the compiler is going to put this in a sensible place and isn't going to cause a problem. So even though this might not cause an issue all of the time, we should still fix it. So a good question for anyone is, what, do, what does anyone think is going to happen when I copy 10 bytes into a 9-byte buffer? Stack error? You can try that. I'm going to save it. Compile it. So, Dan, how confident are you? Nothing happens. It won't, it won't error because it's not big enough. Because computers like to operate on... I won't say... So, they like to operate on byte boundaries... So things like, you know, odd numbers, what's going to happen under the hood, probably, I can't say for sure because I haven't looked at the, the, the assembly, is this is going to be expanded to a 10-byte buffer, most likely. 
Doesn't mean it's always going to happen, but not a good idea. What we're going to do now is let's... Last time I tried this, it didn't work, so I'm very interested to see if it will. So we're going to copy this time. We're going to copy a thousand bytes from buffer one. I'm going to place a thousand bytes into buffer zero. Actually, if I do this the other way around, that's right, because it might the stack ordering might get funny. I hope it doesn't reorder it. I'm going to copy a thousand bytes from buffer one, which is above here. And we're going to copy it into buffer zero, which is nine bytes, which means we've got nine hundred and ninety-one byte overflow. So if we recompile this now, still doesn't do anything. Let me. Try and de let me try and decrease this. I just want to generate an error. I'm not. I, I would try. I would go for and debug this, but um, it's going to take some. It's going to take too much finishing. So what's happening here is, as you said before, Dan, we have a stack smashing detected, a segmentation fault. It does a stack smashing detected. Um, I'm not sure if you are you guys familiar with stack canaries. So, so what's happening here, to prevent a segmentation fault happening, the program is detecting that an overflow has happened and it's preemptively terminating the program. So this is actually, I mean, this is still sort of like a bug, right? And this can still be exploited. If you're doing this on Linux, as a really good example, and you are forking the data, you can actually iteratively brute force the stack canaries out and even DASLR the binary and then be able to attack it. So I wrote an exploit a couple of years ago that bypassed 64-bit full ASLR on the binaries, the binary itself, all of the libraries, the security cookie, and uh, what would you call it, um, data execution prevention, to actually bypass everything and get to a point where we can exploit the binary. So just because you see stack smashing detected doesn't mean it's non-exploitable. It depends on those other circumstances, particularly if it's a server process. So in the first instance, it crashed. However, in this instance, even though a bug was happening, a bug was occurring, even though that there is a bug, there is, we are copying too much data from buffer 1 into buffer 0, nothing happened. So the question is, is how do we detect this? I think it's a very valid point. So there's a really cool little thing called address sanitizer, and I'll explain this later. So what you would do on the command line is add this much like we did with the fuzzer last week so dash f sanitize equals address is this will add some extra instrumentation into the binary and checking to see even if we have non i guess exploitable errors or non-critical errors what it's going to do is we rerun it now i have to zoom out a bit for this we run it now it generates this nice big core dump it generates this nice big dump all right so one thing i will do i will just build this with symbols sorry source code and it says error address sanitizer stack buffer overflow it's detected there's a stack buffer overflow there's been a write of 10 at this but this this location here in memory it's converted this because we've added source code if we look in the file at line 9 if i would do that now so if i just uh, film that at line 9 it's picked up the exact line where the stack buffer overflow occurs we can go back do some more analysis it says it's a write, so it's going to be uh, an overwrite, not an overread. And it says it's it's come from buffer zero. Uh, so the issue is on buffer buffer zero, and buffer zero goes from thirty two offset to forty one, so it's nine bytes big and sixty four to seventy four here buffer one, which means this one here is ten bytes big, but this one here is only nine bytes big. So that's where the issues occurred. There's a little sort of display here for the actual memory address lined up and, and what I would call the um, guards and the shadow bytes. I'll explain them in a bit. But what we've been able to do is even though this hasn't caused a crash, we're able to pick on much smaller bugs. And this is what I sort of alluded to when I was discussing it here. So we have this notion that we can have big bugs, as I've said, and small bugs that happen in a, in a program. The big bugs, are the one that I wrote, the one, sorry, the ones that I wrote that actually caused a either segmentation fault or stack smashing detected or some sort of other report. The small bugs are the ones that I've described here that don't necessarily cause a crash but could still be exploitable. 
I'll explain Heartbleed a bit later if no one's particularly familiar with it. But this is a really good this is a really good use case for using these address sanitizers. So let's talk strategies. If I'm a software developer, I want to find the biggest, most critical bugs first and fix them. I might not care about these smaller issues just yet. I think you always should care about these smaller issues, but I'm going to care about these really big critical issues first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first compile this binary within AFL with the AFL compiler, sorry. And then I'm going to run it under AFL without any sanitizers on. And what that's going to enable me to do, hopefully, is it's going to identify these really big critical vulnerabilities here. So what will happen is we'll be able to fix these first. Once we've done that, after some, some amount of time, we can then go back through, rebuild the binary with the address sanitizer I showed you just now, the demonstration, and we can go through and fix these smaller issues. Now, one thing I wanted to highlight too was if if we you can just enable the sanitizer from the beginning and it will eventually pick up on the bugs. But if you consider you want to fix these bigger issues first, and let's say here that in one function, so one code block from the beginning to end, we have a small issue and a big issue. If we if we enabled the sanitizer in the in the beginning and we started fuzzing this function or this sort of code block here what would happen is we'd hit this small bug which might only be an overwrite or overread by one still a bug but not a really big critical issue and then we will first have to fix this and then rerun the program before we find this big bug so what we're doing is we're identifying the smaller issues first before the big issues doesn't mean that's always the case but what I like to do is I like to run the fuzzing engine first, AFL or libfuzz or clang, uh, libfuzz or hongfuzz, without any of the sanitization on. Once I've done that and I'm sufficient that it's not found anything big at the moment, even though it doesn't mean there's nothing there to find, I will then, re I will then enable the sanitizers and go back through and fuzz the binary. And what this is going to enable me to do, like I said, is fix these big bugs first. And then once that's happened, I'm going to be able to fix these smaller ones later. Is everyone happy with that? Cool. One thing I really wanted to make people appreciate. But this doesn't... Is anyone familiar with Heartbleed? I mean, other than just the names. Anyone know what it, actually how it worked? So, so, so one, one, one thing that happens with Heartbleed... And this is a really classic example of why sanitizers are really good. Another thing I will say, actually, before I go into that, is some developers have actually chosen to leave these, this sanitization code on. Because if you have a sanitizer and it doesn't cause sufficient slowdown in your binary for the users to notice or care, and you enable the sanitization, what's going to happen is it's going to detect more issues that are potentially exploitable, particularly if you have something like Heartbleed, and it's going to crash out. Now, it's not very performant, it does slow down, but if you've decided that your software is able to, I guess, handle it, then you can actually just take an approach of, why don't we just compile all of our software with the sanitizers on, and hopefully we don't have enough a bigger performance hit, but what it will do is it will add an extra layer of protection to the binary, whether or not that's what something people do, I don't know. Yeah. It's... Yeah. I'm... So it's very yeah. So so this is very, very, very useful for debugging. The one thing the only difference I would say is that with debugging you typically have symbols and source code enabled. You don't need this with the sanitizers. It's very nice to, to just prevent any sort of potential exploits from occurring or sort of potential vulnerabilities being exploited. 
but I wouldn't say that it, it it's presents the same risks as debugging because with debugging, like I said, you might have you know extra error messages that you don't want people to uh, know about, or you might have extra sort of symbols included. So, so you don't need that, but it will crash with the with the sort of smaller issues. So, so the the classic example that I'll just sort of go to very quickly is if people if people aren't you know very familiar with how Heartbleed worked, is we we had what well you had you had a HTTP server, or particularly Apache server. You had an Apache server on the right, yes, and on the left you had some sort of client. Now there was a sub module within the Apache server that allowed heartbeats. So you're a client, you set much like how ICMP works, but you send a message from the client to the server, the Apache server, and the sub module would return the data back to you. And the message that it sent, you would have a, let's say if this was 20 bytes big, say this is 20 bytes big, you could specify within the message how big. The message was now the problem with heartbleed was is it would always completely trust the size of the message and it would never verify that the actual size of the data received was what was the same as the one in the message so what you could do is you could send a message like this you could send a message that again it's 20 bytes big but within the binary you say it's 100 bytes so even though I'm saying that I'm sending you 100 bytes, I'm only sending you 20 bytes. Now what should logically happen is you should say, hang on a minute, this is 80 bytes larger than this. There's something gone wrong here. Heartbleed, the bug was, is it would just implicitly trust this, and then when you had some memory, it would just send you back the initial 20 bytes plus the 80 bytes that you'd asked for. And these 80 bytes included things like private keys, private information, server data, credit card numbers, passwords, anything you could imagine. And if you if you manage to, you know, read enough, you know, enough past the actual amount of data you liked, you could start getting your hands on some very, very interesting uh, and very sensitive information. Now, the problem with this is that when this bug was exploited and this vulnerability is if I send this message to the server, it wouldn't crash. It wouldn't. It wouldn't just stop working. It would just send these bytes back. Now, if we were to fuzz this, the fuzzer wouldn't know that this is a problem, because it wouldn't know that this over this overread is occurring. So, what would happen instead is it would just miss it completely. But because we've got this this idea of the sanitizer, we can enable that, which will actually detect if we have these overreads and overwrites occurring. So, one thing I'm going to do here. So I'm going to change this here, and I'm going to change the overwrite. So here, just remember here, so this buff 0 is 9 bytes, this buff 1 is 10 bytes. This is the destination, and this is the source. So we're overwriting this buffer by 1 byte. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change the direction. So instead, even though this buffer 1 now has 10 bytes big, we're overreading 1 byte from buffer 0. So this is less likely to cause a but less likely to cause a crash. But if I run this again, we get this crash data. Again, address sanitizer. But this time, if you look before, it said there was a write size of ten. This time, it said there's a read size of ten. Again, it's described the area it's happened. But this time, you know, it's it's trying to read from nine bytes here, trying to write to ten bytes here. So this type of thing as well will detect those sort of more difficult bugs to find. It'll also it's also able to identify th thread issues or um, race conditions in some sort of, in some aspects. It's also very good at, be at being able to detect double double freeze, use after free type issues, and it can also detect uh, what do you call it um, memory leaks. So if you if you keep allocating data and never free the data, it's able to go through and tell you where your memory leak occurs. The really nice thing about the sanitizers as well is it can say you've allocated some uh, you've allocated a buffer here at this line of code and then you've then you've dereferenced it here and then you've used it here and this is where the bugs occurred and it can go through and do all of this sort of post-mortem analysis for you it takes a bit of time to sort of get your head around what all of this means but it's really not that difficult I've, I've basically explained most of it and the only thing i need to tell you is what this means however 
to do that, I'm going to have to really get into the nitty gritty of what virtual memory what virtual memory is. Does anyone here have a lot of confidence that they understand exactly what virtual memory is? Yeah. So, so Mark is old enough. Mark is old enough that um, <laughs> that the, 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 there was like old school computer science days when when this type of thing happened. But I'll, I'll, I'll explain it here just for um, just for brevity. Let me just flip to a new page. Oh, I literally I've been run out of my book. Have I? Oh no, I've got one page left. Oh, do I? Yep. So, oh, just flip over here. And back to my desk. So one thing I wanted to say is, is just to give people a very brief, brief, brief primer on how memory works. Now, if anyone ever goes to Bletchley Park, if you go past the actual park itself, there's it's called the National uh, Computing Museum, I think, or National Computing History Museum, that's next door. And this has the Colossus, and it has the bomb bomb machine in that actually cracked the, track, cracked the 11 code. But one of my favorite exhibits in here is, it looks a bit like this. So you have this grid. So you've got this grid or lattice. If anyone's been there, they'll know what I mean. And it looks a bit like this. It's just a load of wires. And on each one of these wires, you have a magnet at the intersections. And let me just fill this out. And where these magnets are, is this can actually store data. So this is physical memory that exists within uh, within a very early computer. It's not a lot. It's one, two. You can literally count the bytes, and you can go down the boards and sorry, go down the boards and count the bits. But what happens here is the idea with these magnets is depending on the way they're wound, is you can energize them or de-energize them in such a way that flips the magnetic flux to the opposite direction. If you're able to flip the flux which is a very tongue twisty thing to say, flip the flux, what you can do is it will either represent a one or a zero. Now, I'm, what I'm going to describe now is not how memory works. This is sort of the very old school, but conceptually, this is how it works. You know, this was early 19, you know, 50s, 1940s, late 1940s memory type blocks. This is not how RAM works now. It's not how hard drives work. It is for complete illustrative purposes, but I want to hone what physical memory actually means. Now, the one thing I've sort of been using for the scenario is I want to add two numbers together. And I pick the numbers, uh, let's say nine, and I hope you guys know your binary, and I think it was um, three. No, is it four? Actually, let's say nine and two. Why don't we say nine and two? So what we're going to do is we have some sort of CPU off to the side. And what we've told the CPU is that whatever we place, or whatever bit pattern we place here, and then whatever bit pattern we place here, if you see two bit patterns here, add them together and produce the result on here. And remember, this is literally physical wires round and round magnets. And we're able to detect which, which magnets are energized and which ones aren't to be able to detect if there's a one or a zero being, being, being written. So one thing we do is first, computers don't work in uh, deanery. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert this value nine, we're going to convert it to binary. So the binary for nine is one, zero, zero, one. If people want a quick refresher, this is the eight column. So we have one, eight, zero, fours, zero, twos, and one, one. If you take an eight and you take a one and you add them together, you get nine. The bit pattern for two is zero for zero eight, zero for zero fours, one for one two, and zero for zero ones. So we know this bit pattern here is nine and this bit pattern here is two. And I explain the rules. The rules are in this first line here, I'll just call it a register just for just for simplicity's sake. In this first line here, or this register, we have placed the bit pattern nine, and in the second register here. Or line of or line of magnets or memory, we were going to place two. So what I'm going to do is 
I can energize one of these wires. So the first thing I want to do, let's say I want to energize this wire. So I energize this first wire. However, that's not enough power to be able to flip the particular uh, mag that they're interested in. So the next thing I'm going to do is energize this wire on the side. And as you can see, where they meet here and here is this exact point here. So what's going to happen is we're going to flip this the flux of this magnet, we're going to energize this magnet, and that's going to store some charge or some data at this exact point. Now we need to do the same for this one. So we've already got this one line energized. We're going to apply another current or another voltage here, and it's going to flip this. And what happens here is this, if this magnet here is energized, we know it means one. If this one isn't energized, it's zero. If this one's not energized, it's zero. But if this one's energized, it's one. So we do that for the first layer of memory. The second thing we want to do is we want to energize this one here. So we energize this line and we energize this line. Again, this line here, this line here, where they meet, that's where the magnet gets energized. And when it's energized, that represents two. So zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one for nine and two. And what I said for these rules is if the CPU detects a bit pattern on here, or it detects a bit pattern on here, what it's going to do is it's going to add both of them together and it's going to produce the result here. Now I know that nine add two is 11. At least I hope it's 11. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw the bit pattern for 11. So 11 is one eight, zero fours, one two. So we have eight add two and is 10 and one one equals 11. So we know the bit pattern for this third register down here is going to have to equal one zero one one. What the CPU is going to do now is after we've had the input here is it's going to flip. It's going to energize this line then the first one, not going to energize the second one, energize the third one, and energize the fourth one. An important point here is we're able to process a very rudimentary calculator using this type of memory by energizing these lines, and the CPU is going to sit there waiting for this input here. It's going to be connected using these here, and it's going once it's done that, it's going to detect whether or not these bit patterns have been enabled. If these bit patterns have been enabled, it's going to output data onto this line, which we can then read and represent on some paper, or we can represent it on a monitor. Now, the way you used to do this and you used to feed this this data into this sort of this the, the idea of here is you would have these punch cards. You would literally have cards with holes punched out on them that would represent these bit patterns in memory, and you would feed them into a machine. And the for each punch you would have, it would energize this bit of memory in a certain way. And once the program was loaded, the CPU knew what to do, and it would just perform a set of actions based on this memory, and you would get a result on another in somewhere else in memory. But like I said, this is a really rudimentary idea, but I wanted to get 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 it sort of people understanding. Fundamentally, on this level, other than a lot of abstraction, is this is still how memory works. We still have this idea that these are locations. We need to put bit patterns in certain places, bit patterns in other places, and once that's happened, the CPU, if it gets an instruction, it will know what to do with these two different things. So we send some instruction. Let's say the instruction line's here. There's 200 and, uh, sorry. There is 16 instructions we can give it. The first instruction is add, and it knows that to read these first two lines and output the result here, based on what we feed into this line here. And this is, like I said, this is how memory works. Um, th these are called address lines. What's really cool about this is if we, let's say, let's label these. Why don't we label these? I'm trying to think what's the best pen. So why don't I label this? We're going to address, label these uh, lines. We're going to call this the line number zero, this line, line number one, this line, line number two, and this line, num line number three, this line, number zero, one, two, three. So instead of enabling these lines as I'm doing, let's say by connecting some crocodile clip with some battery, what I can do now is I can say on this punch card, I want to energize, for instance, this first magnet here, this first area of memory, I want to change the value. So what I can do now 
is I can come down here and read it. So let's go, let's do it this way. So we come to the first here, we see this is on line number zero. So we say, okay, let's record line number zero. But we also want to analogize it on line number zero here. So we say line number zero here, zero here, which is exactly this location. We want to apply a voltage to energize and change that from a zero to a one. At the same time, we can choose another location. Let's do a second one. So this value here, three, zero, this is line number three, but line number zero on the right, we can say this is line number zero, three. This also works for the other direction as well. So let's pick something more, uh, let's pick something a bit different. Uh, let's pick this one here. We want to energize the next line. So we pick line number two and line number one. So these values here, when I'm talking about these lines, these are these are addresses. This is what the address. This is physically what the address lines are. Now, like I said, the complexity will be, it will be far more complex. But your CPU physically has connections to the you know via the address bus to these values. And when you place in you know and you know you place an address, you say I want to change the value at this address. I want to change the value at this address, or I want to change this value at this address. And you can do this you know, for like 64 gig of memory now, you know, two, hundreds of terabytes of memory in very, very big sort of server farms, they're able to turn around and reference very particular areas of memory and say what value you want them to be. Is everyone okay with that? Is that happy, are you happy with that, Mark? That, that's like a really basic way to explain memory and and, and it, like I said CPUs have address lines they've got data lines they've got instruction lines but they physically just connect into the RAM and the other components like this at some level and what they do is they energize certain lines to detect say whether or not this is one or zero this is why in a 64 bit you know a 64 bit processor they've got 64 bit address lines which means you can have two to the 64 bits or different areas you can address because you physically have these lines and there's only so many of them you can energize in a certain way. That's basically... Hmm? Yeah, so it, it depends how you do it. So I can also, if, if this here stores energy, I can just, you know, place a place a probe here and read this and place a probe here and read this. And it'll say, oh, this one's energized and this one's energized. So you can say, actually, I can work backwards. And, you know, if I read this here, I know that that area of memory is energized. Or stores a bit value of some sort, either a zero or a one. So, yeah, you can read and write to, you know, write to memory in this way. So the punch cards would so, that, so like you might you might have some sort of order. I'm not going to say this is exactly how they work, but you might have some sort of order, and maybe you know maybe these values. Maybe you've got three of them, and maybe the order that you place them in represents three things. The first card, it will it always accepts only three cards. The first card will always set this first line of memory. So I say what the address of this memory is and what value I want it to be. So I put this first first card in and it sets these bit values here. The second card always sets the third the, the second line here. So I put the next one in, the first bit's been set, it sets the next one. The third punch card, for instance, will be the instructions. So it will say down here, I'm going to put the instruction that I want. So this is the first input data, this is the second input data, and I'm giving it the instruction add or subtract. And what it's going to do is it's going to know I'm going to add, add this value. I'm going to add another value and based on this it's going to be able to say here is the output and then you're going to be able to able to read this output and then you're going to be able to display it to screen or you're going to be able to display it to uh you know a, a printout of some sort do you understand so, so that's the general idea so i'm not going to say that's exactly how they work because they're more complicated than that but you still have the idea of you know punch card is literally it's like a keyboard of just loading programs into memory so these things just map to locations and memory and instructions of where to put things and what to do. And that's essentially what programming is, right? You set these instructions up in certain way, you put data in certain locations, and based on that, you perform certain actions.
No, it doesn't need to always be in hexadecimal. Um, computers use, uh, I've known computers that use deanery, 8 bits, octal, hexadecimal. Well, hexadecimal is just more convenient for us because it allows us to represent entire bytes much easier by two nibbles. It's just, it just you know, 8 splits into 4 far easier. And, you know, if you have 4 bits, you can represent 16 values. Those 16 values are 0 to 9, uh, A to F. That just makes it more convenient for us. The computer doesn't care. The computer just sees memory like this. It just sees energized areas that it knows to take this data and do something with and perform an action. Incredibly complicated, don't get me wrong, but that's what it's doing. Cool. So, so, so that's what I would call physical memory. So we haven't yet got to what virtual memory is. So this was the sort of idea in the way computers were first programmed. So if we have, let's just draw, you know, I'm going to change the, the shape of memory because, you know, drawing, a, drawing the lattice or the grid, it just becomes very, very arduous. And this value here goes from 0x00 to 0xff. So this is 256 bytes big from 0 to 255. And this is just some block of memory. And let's say I've got four different programs. So I've got four programs. Four different bits of software and call this one, two, three, four. What I want to do now as a programmer, I want to, to be able to run my program in the same way that we loaded up punch cards, I'm going to need some way to load this program into some area in memory. So what I'm going to do is let's just let's just let's just go in order. The first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take this first program. And I'm going to place it in the first area of memory. So the first area of memory is here. So this is program number one. Program number one. Next, I'm going to load number two into memory. I'm going to load number two into memory here. And then finally, I'm going to load number three into memory. So this is number three. So what's happened now is we've run out of memory. All of these in some way add up to 256 bytes. Maybe not exactly. But based on the boundaries of memory, we're only able to load three programs in there. Another really big problem with sort of programs originally is that whenever I loaded, let's say, program one into memory, it always had to be loaded into the same location. Number one always said for me to run, I always need to be run, I need to start at zero zero. I always need to start at that first address. So what? So you would have this issue. Let's say I didn't actually want to run program one or two. I only wanted to run program three. Program three knows it always needs to be at this offset in memory. It always knows that to run correctly, I need to be exactly here. However, we don't want to run program one and two. We want to run program four. So we have program four. We say program four, you always run at zero. So we say program four, you can always run at the start of memory. At this offset program number four which is fine we haven't run out of memory now here comes the problem what happens if we want to run program one and program four at the same time program one always needs to be loaded at address zero zero and program four always needs to be loaded at address zero zero we've got this issue now where we physically can't run that program because we can't load it at the same place over each other. And this was sort of how programs were first written. But not only that, is you needed for every single program that could be run in this computer, you needed a giant list of which program ran at which address. So you made sure that if I was going to load some data into this, you know, into RAM here, that it wouldn't overwrite another, uh, another bit of software. Do you understand that? This was like really early computer days. Cool. So this was the this was sort of the the, the original problem with um, software. You had this issue where you couldn't overwrite, you couldn't run binaries in the same location, and you also had to keep a really big list of where binaries run. So the way this was solved was with something called virtual memory, and it was managed by your CPU. So you've got your CPU here. Let's just call your CPU, and within here you had something called an MMU. CPU, Central Processing Unit, MMU, Memory Management Unit. Uh, 
and let's draw RAM again. Let's say we've got RAM. So this is our this is our limited set of RAM. 0xff, remember, T5, 6 bytes from 0 to T55. And now we have program number 1. Program 1. What I do now is instead of always needing to know exactly where this area had to be in memory, sorry, to know exactly where this uh, value here had to be in, in a particular area of memory, what I do instead is I have this thing called an MMU. So I say to number, I say to program number one, you can load yourself anywhere in memory as long as you don't take up more than 256 bytes. It doesn't matter if you go right to the end, it doesn't matter if you're right at the beginning, you can load yourself anywhere. So number one comes along and says, okay, I'll load myself at address number zero. Fine. The CPU takes this program, number one, right, has a big list on the right hand side. And the first column is the program number, program number one. And the second number is where it actually was loaded in memory. So zero, zero. So that's fine. So the first program gets loaded in to address zero, zero. So program number one gets loaded here. This is, remember, this is physical memory. This is the actual RAM, much like I described on the other page, that sits on your computer. So now we want to load program number two. Now remember in the first instance, program number two and program number one didn't interfere with each other. They can be loaded and you know they can be loaded on the same on the same computer. So program number two gets loaded into memory. The CPU says, excellent, I'm going to load you at let's just say address 0x16. So you've now been loaded at address 0x16. And you've been loaded into memory here. This is program number two. However, we said that program number four couldn't be loaded into the same location. But we want to run program number four. We want to run program number four. Program number four gets sent to the CPU. Number two. Did that in the wrong colour. So program number four gets set to the CPU. And it gets told it's going to be loaded in. Sorry, it doesn't get told. The CPU records that program number four was loaded at address 0x80. So at 08 address 080 here, it gets loaded. So program number four. So whereas before we had to keep a big list of the locations that any of these programs could be loaded, and they couldn't be loaded into the same location, what happens now is the CPU takes these programs and loads them anywhere it can or anywhere it wants to. All it needs to do is it needs to keep a record of where it's placed each program in memory. If you've ever come across disk defragmentation, um, when people sort of used the old style uh, hard drives, you know, the disk drives, what would happen is your computer would place a you know, your, a file at the start, it would be very nice. And then what would happen over time is as you deleted some stuff and as you added and installed new programs, what would happen is these things would become broken up into little bits and they'd be loaded in different locations. Defragmentation would go through and it would try and reorganize the disk to make it more efficient when it's accessing data. And this is the same sort of concept with RAM. As you have this, where these things can be loaded in any order, which is really, really, really nice. So. Eventually you will run out of RAM, but at the same time, what's really nice about this is if we only had, let's say, zero, let's say we we had we had a much smaller memory space, let's say zero X A zero, so we don't actually have that much RAM, even though program number four, you know, might think it's loaded at a particular location, the CPU will actually load it into some some area. So what the CPU can actually do is lie to the programs and, and say you've got more memory or at least you can load yourself in different locations that might not necessarily exist in physical memory. Now this idea of you know lying to the programs is what's called virtual memory. So you have sort of this layer in the middle. So you have virtual memory. It's virtual. So you have virtual memory. What happens is the CPU tells each one of these pro these programs or these processes, you have 256 bytes of memory to play with. 
Obviously, if you tried to load 256 bytes, it would run out of memory because it physically doesn't have that. But it just tells these processors you have 260 by 5 but 256 bytes. It says this to each one of them. So each one of these programs think they've all been loaded at address number zero. However, what's actually happened is as this has gone through the MMU and gets loaded into the you know the physical RAM, the CPU is keeping a record of where each program is loaded at its particular offset. So if you take one of these programs out and you want to load another in, and another comes in, say number three, so we have a third program, and we've stopped running program number two, for instance, we've now stopped running this. Oops. We no longer run this program. This is now empty memory. It can delete this entry here, but load program number three here now, so it loads program number three, and is able to say, Instead of having program number two here, we now replace it with program number three. So this idea, this lie that the CPU or the MMU tells to these processors is called virtual memory. This is physical memory. Now you never, you basically never touch it unless you're really low level or you're at the start of initializing, um, proce you know, processor, initializing your processor in real mode where you actually have access to this. What happens is you have all these things called page tables and all these abstractions added that prevent you from actually accessing memory directly, but also give you really nice features. You don't need to know where each one of these programs has to be loaded to avoid overwriting another one, but at the same time, if one gets inloaded out of memory for whatever reason or stopped, you can load another one in. It doesn't matter. It will always say you can be loaded at address number zero, and each time you want to access some data at a particular offset, let's say here, let's say this is two bytes in, two bytes into that process, uh, just draw a switch. So this is two bytes into that process for number for process number three here. Even though this program here thinks it's loaded at number number two at two bytes offset, what happens is the CPU will just add whatever values in here to two and just translate between real memory, so the actual real memory, the physical memory, and this idea of virtual memory where it's being lied to. And the MMU, the mobile um the memory management unit in the CPU does this translation via this sort of like idea of what's called page tables and does these lookups. So you load segments of memory into the RAM and then you're able to read it and write to it at will and it sorts this all out for you. So that's the idea of virtual memory. Is that in line with what you learned, Mark? Yep. Yep, that's physical memory. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, remember, this is your physical. And this is your, yeah. Yeah, and your, your, your idea of virtual memory and what process has been loaded. So you have this table that the CPU does the translation. Yep. Yep. hasn't changed virtual memory really hasn't changed does the same thing it's a really useful tool however that is not the only thing that's important one other thing i will say to people just because people get um sort of get this confused a lot is something called paging so if everyone understands this idea of virtual memory the other thing that people should really understand is what i like to call paging now everyone always gets paging wrong and they always have this idea of paging to disk so what happens, the next sort of, or, or one of the next things, those big things that happened, is let's draw RAM again, or again, 0x, 0, 0x, 0, 0, 0, 0, FF. And we have, let's just say, three processes that we want to load. We have three, three bits of software, one, two, and three, and three. What paging does is we st remember we still have this idea of virtual memory that you know these processes are being lied to about where they actually live in the physical memory we have this virtual memory we still have this virtual memory layer that exists here but what happens now is some of these bits of you know some of these binaries are going to be larger than others so what actually happens is the cpu comes along 
and it splits these programs as it's being loaded into chunks and these chunks here are called pages so the, the size that I, you normally see them is uh, 4096 large, so 496 bytes big, um, or whatever you want to call them, and that's the most typical that I see. And, but each one of these, the important bit here is that each one of these gets you know split into several of these chunks. If you don't have enough you know chunk left, it will just fill it with zeros, it will just pad it out. But this is the idea. So we have, we have. A, let's say process number one it gets split into three chunks process number two gets split into two chunks and process number three gets split into three chunks I'll describe the I'll draw these chunks in different color as I get very confusing one two three and one two three paging is the splitting and loading into memory chunk by chunk as opposed to loading the entire process in at once so let's say I'm going to load program number one into memory what you would have is let's just draw program let's do program number one chunk one so program number one chunk one we have program number one let's just draw this program number one chunk one gets loaded there program number two chunk two Pro program number one sorry chunk two gets loaded here remember these are pages these are individual splits of the program are called pages but let's say for whatever reason this pro this loading process gets interrupted and the CPU decides to start loading program number two into memory. So what it does is it starts loading program number two into memory. So program number two starts to get loaded. Oops, let me switch your pens. Program number two starts to get loaded. So program number two, chunk one, gets loaded into this location. And then the CPU switches back. It switches back to program number one. So program number one, chunk three gets loaded into memory oops program number one chunk three gets loaded into memory here uh, one oh, I didn't draw the didn't draw the program number one and then finally program number ch two chunk two gets loaded into memory program number two chunk two gets loaded into memory so what you have you have this pattern now where each of these programs has been split up into these even these even even chunks these chunks are called pages and what happens here is around about 496 bytes is you've got two from program 1 then you've got program 2 then you've got program 1 and then you've got program 2 again but the CPU is able to load these in different chunks but also at the same time say it keeps a record of which one gets loaded into which area through this idea of virtual memory and this lie so this program number one thinks it's at one particular location in one whole block in your memory your cpu has actually split it up into different areas and it's the job of your the page tables in your C, in your in your memory which sits somewhere else and your cpu to translate between these locations so when i request this particular chunk here it goes and grabs it now this led to a very very nice feature so let's say that program number one chunk two this one here isn't being utilized a lot let's say in every single other area here program number one chunk two was not being used but the rest of it was every other program here apart from this particular chunk for some reason this is some sort of process or, or bit of the process that just sits there never gets touched a very 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 nice feature of paging is that you can have your physical disk over here. I'm just drawing as a disk just to illustrate. What the CPU will do, or the kernel will do, the operating system, is it will say this chunk here hasn't been touched in a very long time. So what it'll do is it un unloads it from memory and physically places it on your secondary storage, your hard disk, um, or something else you've got. And it will do this sort of incrementally so if it hasn't been touched. This idea of taking these chunks out, these page chunks, and placing them on disk is called paging to disk. Now, many people get confused that there's terminology. So when I say paging, they think that it's just this idea of paging bits of memory to disk. But it's not paging. It's actually the splitting up of different processes and different bits of software into these chunks called pages and loading them into, these sort of, into this different way. And paging to disk is just when you need to unload them. Because let's say we unload two of these chunks... Actually, let's say we unload three of these chunks. Let's say we unload this one, this one, and let's say this one here. 
So even though we still have the critical components of you know, program number one here running and program number two, we've unloaded these three chunks. What's nice about this is that because we've now got program three here, we can start loading chunk number one from program three into memory. So we can now overwrite this. If this bit's been you know, taken out and unpaged, we can load program number one. Uh, sorry, program number three, chunk one. Remember, this is no longer in memory. It's on the disk. And we can do the same here. We can load program number three, chunk two. And then finally, because this has been unloaded to disk, we can load program number three, chunk three. But this presents a bit of a problem as well. So this is the idea of paging to disk. It doesn't. It doesn't It always makes space. It doesn't necessarily make space for a particular program. But what happens now is if we need to use one of these chunks that is on the disk. So we need to want to use one of these chunks on the disk. Now we need to load it back into memory. But we don't have any space in memory. So what has to happen now is the processor needs to decide which one of these chunks is the ones that's the least utilized. And if it's the one that's the least utilized, it will unload one of them out of memory and back into the disk. So it places one of these chunks out into, from memory into the disk, and then it loads another chunk back into its location. But as soon as that's finished operating or finished processing, it's going to need to unload that chunk again or a different chunk and load it back in. So this idea of constantly unloading these pages and loading these pages back in is swapping. So you have this thrashing between memory and the disk that happens, you know, memory and the disk that happens because you need to load this bit into memory before you can actually do anything with it. This is where you run out of memory. So this is the idea of paging. You take these processes and you split them into chunks and you are able to load these in in sort of any old order as long as they're on byte boundaries. And if you can do that, you've got this idea of paging that enables you to be able to, it's more performant because you can load things in, you know, into, into stages, but at the same time you have advantages that you can page back out to disk. Is everyone happy with that? Yep. The what? Ah, has a really... What if, if there's a credential here? And it gets placed to the disk. It gets stored on the disk. What, from the disk? Yep. Uh, well, yeah, you, so you will have a page file that sits somewhere on your disk. So the other important thing to say here is that if you if you forensically analyze a disk, what a disk doesn't do is it doesn't overwrite data till it needs to. It just marks it as not re, not uh, it marks it as uh, to be deleted. So let's say I load one of these pages and it's got some really protected secure key in it and it places it at a certain location on the disk here. Let's say there is some really big high value item right here. And this gets loaded in here through paging, yeah? Well, what happens is that when the disk comes along and this gets loaded back into memory, is the disk will, say, well, the disk will just say, or the, or the firmware on the disk, is it will say, you this needs to be deleted. It's marked to be deleted, but it doesn't delete it. It doesn't delete it until it needs to because it's actually writing data, more data than it has to because it'll slow it down, but it'll also cause wear levels or so like the wear level on here to increase because like, you know, these things only have so many writes. They have, you know, they can only operate for so long because if you do it so long, you, you literally physically degrade this memory and you physically degrade this disk. You can only write so much. So what they don't do is they don't delete this. So... If you have a particularly sensitive value that gets paged out from memory, even though you necessarily haven't written it to disk, but it does get paged out from memory to disk, yeah, and then you go along and you say pick this disk up and then read it forensically, there is a yeah yeah there's a there's a chance that that key is still going to be on the disk. What you can do, if it's a very high secure application, is you can say, I don't want this particular variable or this particular program or this particular area of memory ever to be paged to disk, so it prevents this problem. So whenever I've written in the past really small uh, secure bits of code that have sensitive keys or passwords in them, 
I mark the whole process as this can never be written, this can never be page to disk. Because if it can never be page to disk, there's a chance that someone can pick up that disk later. If this is encrypted, it doesn't matter so much. But if it isn't, there's a chance that someone can pick up this and then be able to go and recover that. Do you understand? It's a good question, actually. I've not actually covered that yet, but that's a very good question. So that's the idea of paging. Remember, we have this virtual memory lie and we have this idea of paging. The reason why I bring that up is to sort of describe these sanitizers a bit better. So, as part of these sanitizers, what actually happens is this idea of um, virtual memory is you get a, let's say, what do you get? A process loaded. Uh, just like ping on. Is that right one? So, you get a process loaded. So, we have a process that gets loaded here. This is our process we want to attack and we want to fuzz. And this has, let's say, it's got a bunch of minor bugs in it. Very small minor bugs. We we do the first fuzzing to find all the big bugs, but there's no bugs, big bugs here anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to only investigate these small little issues. We, we wrap it around the extra instrumentation, the sanitizer, which is able to detect smaller issues that may not cause a problem. As part of the sanitizer, what happens is it also, it doesn't actually store the data, but it also creates another area in memory. This shadow memory, this is what they call shadow memory. And it has the chunks, so each time you have a little buffer in here, or, or, or down to the strategy, I won't say every time, depends on the strategy, but generally every time you've got some sort of buffer, heap buffer, stack buffer, some sort of other issue, is what it will do now is it will have this page here, it'll load, it'll load like an area in memory, but it'll put guards on the left hand side and the right hand side. And it, every and then the other thing to say is that whatever action this process here on the left that we've instrumented performs, it will also perform it here in a very sort of simplistic way. So if we have one byte overwrite here, so we, we overwrite one byte here, let's say we have run one byte into memory here, further buffer, it's not going to cause an issue on this side. But because this side has had these guards added, these guards are added as non-readable, non-writable, which means if we ever touch memory in these locations, it will throw an exception. And when that exception gets thrown, we can catch it and say this is a read or a write. So if we try the same thing and we try and write one byte here into this bit of memory, it's going to cause a problem. And this is exactly what the sanitizer is doing under the hood. This has an idea of virtual memory sort of loaded up somewhere else to imitate not it's not copying the physical data necessarily but what it's actually doing the more important thing that it's doing is each time there's a read or a write on stack memory here it's keeping a record and places these little guards around it then you can visibly see this within the process so if i look load this back up we have a buffer in memory here and on the left hand side we have this area here which is known as a, I guess, guard bytes or shadow bytes here. And we have a legend that tells us what these are. So F1 in red here. And remember, this, these are just physical memory locations. Remember, just see these physical memory locations. So at this location here, we have a, a guard and we have some memory or some structure that we are interested. This says this, this is stack memory on the left and it's the red zone. So this is an area we cannot read or write to. And this is a buffer here. The next one is F2 here. Let's see if you can come down here. It's the middle of this. It's the stack mid red zone. So there is another guard page here that's placed itself in between these pages. And on the right hand side, F3, F3 down here, stack right red zone. This is the right hand side. So much like what I described here, we have this right guard and we've got this left guard on the paper. We've actually can physically see it. This is the right guard. This is the left guard, and these are our buffers. And these, these are the areas that are addressable that's you know caused an issue, and these are the other buffers that haven't caused an issue. So the issue is here, you know, at this location within this bit of memory and within this buffer, and it looks like it's been it's it's copied from it's hit that mid guard there and it's thrown some sort of error. So this is why I went into this whole idea of virtual memory. So this is the sort of virtual another virtual area in virtual memory that's been allocated to keep track of where each one of these buffers and these bytes gets written. The nice thing here is you can see that we have a heap red zone, a heap free region. So 
This is if we read or write on the left of the heap. A free heap region, so we can keep track of anything that has been freed. And if we if we touch a bit of memory again, so if we have this area here has been freed, which means we shouldn't be able to access it, and then an access occurs, we know there's a use after free. Again, we have the stack regions, some extra regions, like if they've gone outside the scope, we have some global areas. Um, if there's overflows, if we've hit the stack cookie type of thing, and we can go down here and it'll actually say, this is what your memory looks like. We've placed certain guards in different locations, and we have buffers that are able to read and write to these areas. Does it make does it make more sense when I describe you know what this actually means? Is everyone okay with that? Excellent. My cat's about to jump on me. <laughs> but yeah, so 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 this is this is the idea of being able to fuzz um, with this. Like I said, first what you will do is if I go into let's say duct tape. Let's go into duct tape and code. And I'm going to modify the make file. And oh, actually, I've already added it. So I've got at dash, dash f sanitize equals address here. Um, so I've already placed this in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make dash f make file. I don't know if this will work. It may freak out. Let's see. I think this took an exceedingly long time last time. I can't remember why. But yeah, this, this is going to take a very long time. So I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get it tonight. I remember last time. But this is, you know, this is the idea. We've taken this make file, for instance, uh, CMD line, and we've added this address, this address symbol here. Now, you might get some issues with it, depending on the compiler. Um, but what I would do in the first instance, like I said, is I would build this, you know, duct tape without that sanitizer on to find all those big bugs first, get rid of them sort of potential big issues that cause crashes, then what I would do is I go back through and start enabling these sanitizers. Now these sanitizers aren't just for memory; they can detect uh, stack, like I said, um, heap problems. They can detect problems with uh, if you have threads and you have concurrency issues. They can detect memory leaks. They can do a very, very large amount of things. You can have other things, postmortem tools like Valgrind, you can play with that can sort of analyze code and detect these things. But this is the sort of idea I, I do. You know, depending on what you want to do, if you're a developer and you want to integrate this. Um, you can build your code, let's say libfuzzer, using the LLVM fuzzer test one input sort of strategy. You build it once, you don't put any of the address sanitizer stuff on, maybe in the first instance. Fuzz it, find all the, you know, maybe potentially bigger bugs, if you've done that for enough time. Apply the sanitizer, which will find and iron out any other issues. And then you're able to go through. If you're if you're a vulnerability researcher, um, like me, use something like AFL or Hongfuzz, just because I prefer them using it that way. First, go through and try and find these big bugs. I always try and find the big bugs because as a vulnerability researcher, like I'm really looking for crashes. That's what I want. Those are the big things I'm interested in. But as I explained with Heartbleed, that doesn't mean that they're not exploitable. It just means they're different. So those are the things that I, you know, trigger my spidey senses more. But at the same time, smaller bugs or read-only bugs also cause issues. Is everyone happy with that? Ah, we have some sort of uh, problem here. Oh, God. I can't be bothered to fix that. <laughs> ah, just, just a linking problem. Never mind. But you, but you can do it. I mean, it, you, sometimes you get, like, really weird issues happening. But it's... um, that That's the general strategy I use. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so. So, so the big things you're looking for are areas of memory that um, get freed twice 
areas of memory where you overwrite the uh, stack address, areas of memory where you write into heap metadata, if, if your heap allocator works that way, areas of memory where you overwrite a, a heap pointer, for instance, um, like a function pointer on a heap. I'm trying to think of other ones where you dereference something incorrectly, uh, leading to something like a null pointer dereference. So you've got you've got all these uh, even like, oh, oh god even a memory leak or something. Sorry, my cat's just jumped on the desk. Um, you can have you know even down to an infinite loop. These are all sort of things you you really want to identify and use with fuzzing. So so the, I mean any of those things. If it crashes or wobbles in some way, it can potentially be a bug. But at the same time, if you have some sort of overread vulnerability. That's equally applicable because that was hard bleed. If it's an infinite loop, maybe you can actually DOS the server. Um, or if you're just if you're looking for differential analysis, maybe if I send a really weird bit of data, it logs me in for some reason to an underlying platform. So that's the whole idea of being able to use that, what I say, I guess differential or variant type of analysis where you don't necessarily just try and get it to, you know, perform an error, you go, can this ever exceed what I personally think it shouldn't be able to exceed. Um, whether or not that causes a proper exploitable bug or not it is sort of besides the point but those are all the type of things you want to really find when you're fuzzing cool if everyone's happy with that that's all i really wanted to say for the matter um again i'll mince around to answer questions for people but i hope that's just sort of introduced a bit of the idea of some of the strategies i um i sort of pursue and follow and some of the techniques and the main one is look for big bugs first without sanitizers once you found those big bugs um, enable the sanitizers to find those much smaller ones is everyone happy cool excellent yep So that's page. So that's page file dot sys. That's where that's that's the area where they'll get placed on the disk, so you can actually access it. Um, but that's not virtual memory. Virtual memory is a different concept. Virtual memory is the concept of you don't know where which location in memory you've actually been placed, and the memory management unit of the CPU does the translation between the two. You know, I've never really checked to see where the page file is. I remember it'll be in. Uh, I imagine it'll it'll be somewhere in the. So swaps different. Swaps that well. Swaps that idea where you um got it. it... Uh, there's loads of different things. So things like Kubernetes. If you have a mess with Kubernetes, you can disable swapping, and you can just like physically disable it from the actual kernel and turn it off because it doesn't like this whole idea of swapping. You can have things like swap files, but at the same time, you still have the idea of paging. I've never actually looked where the actual page file is on Linux. I probably should. Um, let me actually look that up. Where is the page file stored on Linux? But even, you know, um, let's have a look. I'm just trying to find what it is. So, so swap, so the swap partition is... Um, is it right? The swap partitions are used for paging? Maybe that's correct. Do you know, I've not actually looked that much into detail like this um, to actually have a look. Let me just have a quick read. So Linux says, Linux does not respond to memory pressure by swapping out whole processes. The virtual memory system does demand paging, which is what I said. So, you know, it tries to remove stuff before it gets to that point. Um, so let's have a look. So swap... Uh, swap ones always the thing, so we can actually see the 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 page file. There we go. Can we actually read it? Do everyone know, everyone know this? You can do you can do this with um. You can actually read the memory in Linux as well. You can uh, so slash dev slash mem. Ah, uh, it's going to be a very bad idea. Oh God. So we've actually can start reading the memory out, which is really interesting. 
So this is like I've done this before. And if you go through here, you should be able to start reading things like elf files and stuff, which are actual uh, physical areas for the memory. So let's just try and find one. Uh, I can't find it. Oh well, I can only, I can only load it in chunks. I can't just load everything, right? Um, but yeah, th so this is a. So so yeah, so um, you know, window uh, Linux has you know swap space, swap partitions for doing this exact thing. Um, swap files for doing this. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, every 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 computer does this in some way, just because it's it's better. And and you have you have some security considerations if you know you're a developer. And I always bring this up if you've got a particularly sensitive thing. You go, I only want to ever decrypt this particular thing in memory. A good example is if you have a you know a sensitive key or a sensitive model for machine learning, and you know and you don't ever mark that as. Um, you don't ever mark that as non-page to disk. What will happen is that will page to the disk, or can happen, and if your disk isn't encrypted, then someone is potentially is able to at least access parts of your model file, or your whole model file, depending on um, what's happened exactly. I wouldn't say it's a very likely attack, but if you've got a particularly sensitive stuff, and you know, you've got a persistent, um, sophisticated attacker, then it could happen. Yep. Cool. Well, next week I want to go into what happens if you don't have access to source code. So it's the it's the final week of your your training. So what happens if you don't have access to the source code? Can you attack binary still? Yes, you can. Windows is a really good example. I won't go into any Windows exact examples, but the same the same tools and stuff work for Windows. Um, I will just explain how you use you know a bit how uh, QMU works and uh, virtualization. And how it uses that to be able to uh, perform fuzzing. Now it's not as fast when you're doing it like this, but you you know not only can you attack stuff without the source code, you can attack systems that also don't aren't necessarily Intel based. You know, PowerPC, MIPS, ARM type stuff. And I will be explaining that all next week.